why we why the hell did we decide to uh, to organize uh, a, a, a seminar series on this topic? And uh, the reason that the, basically the, the reason is that um, in philosophy and environmental philosophy and uh, 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 these type of topics, uh, the Anthropocene as a new geological uh, era or a new ontological framework uh, is emerging. And at the same time, this idea of the Anthropocene also has consequences for our understanding of technology as one of the dominating factors in this constitution of the Anthropocene and the Anthropocene world. And some philosophers that we uh, in our reading group in the in Wageningen, uh, like like Timothy Morton, for instance, uh, some uh, philosophers argue then that um, the Anthropocene involves the end of the world. Huh? So the, in, in planetary technologies result in the end of the world, while others, uh, and in this case also Clive Hamilton, argue that in the Anthropocene it is important to uh, build a new world, so to speak. That is something that you can read in uh, Defiant Earth um, uh, of Clive Hamilton. So there is an, a debate on what effect or what ontological impact do technologies have on the notion of world. Uh, does it involve indeed an end of the world or does it involve a different world or the, the role of technology to constitute a new world? And uh, to this end, we thought we we want to invite a, a broad range of speakers to discuss this and related topics. Um, and uh, in this year and next year, we have in total, I think, um, 12 to 16 speakers that um, that will reflect on these type of issues. So if you are interested not only to hear Clive today, but also in this series, you can write an email to Jochem Zwier and he will make sure that you receive the future invitations and also the links to the um, uh, the videos later on. Um, with this, I would like to give the floor to Jochem to um, uh, introduce Clive, um, and I hope that you all enjoy today. All right, thank you very much, Vincent, for that introduction. Uh, maybe some practicalities first. Uh, some of you were here last time. I recognize some of your faces uh, from uh, Nairat's uh, lecture two months ago. Uh, let's stick to the same uh, format. So there will Clive will talk for about 45 minutes, uh, after which uh, Bronislav Szczynski will offer a prepared response, which will take about 10 to 15 minutes, I think. Uh, and then there's room for discussion. Please use the chat function that you can find on the top of your screen in Teams to um, type out your questions as briefly and as clearly, obviously, uh, as possible. And then, um, of course, Clive can respond to that question. And then uh, if there's enough time, you can follow up on your question. So please make use of the uh, chat function uh, for this. Um, I think that's it for practicality. So let me briefly move on to introduce our speaker for today, which is, I think, hardly necessary, but let's do it. Anyway, uh, Clive Hamilton is professor of public ethics at the Center for Applied Philosophy and public ethics um, and vice chancellor chair in public ethics at Charles Sturge University. Uh, while his latest books are on China's influence in Australia, so Silent Invasion is the book and uh, on the Communist Party of China, uh, Hidden Hand. Uh, the reason why we invited him to this seminar series is, of course, because of his important work on climate change, uh, Reckoning for a Species uh, from 2010, I think, uh, on geoengineering, the Earth Masters book from 2013, and on the Anthropocene, the Defiant Earth book from 2017. So given the theme of our seminar series, we believe Hamilton's voice cannot be ignored, and we are glad to have him with us here today for this reason. Hamilton's lecture is called Rupture and Letting Go. Uh, Clive, thank you very much for being with us here today, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks, Joachim, for that introduction, and um, to Vincent and, and indeed Peter for uh, sponsoring this uh, fantastic uh, and uh, very kind of challenging uh, series uh, so far. Incidentally, the reason why 
I decided to write a couple of books on uh, the Chinese Communist Party and its global influence uh, was because I became so despairing about climate change that emotionally I could not I keep working on it. So I had to find something else to do. So I thought, oh, what the hell, I'll take on this ruthless authoritarian regime, something which I've kind of regretted. But no. um, now back to my true love, uh, the Anthropocene, uh, intellectually my true love. And as you know, uh, the subject uh, uh, tonight is how the arrival of the uh, Anthropocene uh, challenges us to uh, let go of comforting continuities uh, rooted in past uh, ideas and events. Now, there's quite a lot of uh, creative confusion, perhaps I should put it, among scholars on this question, but certain segments of the public are much more certain about what it all means. And for them, the Anthropocene foreshadows the end. And uh, there's, of course, a literary genre uh, known as climate fiction, which is quite popular. Uh, and But more, more interestingly, I think, is what I call existential defeatism, which is quite common in uh, vernacular, that is public reactions to the climate crisis. And this narrative of existential defeatism is uh, very apparent in thousands of uh, comments in response to newspaper articles. You know, you read The Guardian, for example, or, you know, some latest report from on climate change in the Antarctic or whatever, and you look at the comments uh, beneath, it's really quite fascinating. I always go to the the most respected or most liked or most commented on comments to give you a good, a good reflection of what uh, the audience broadly is thinking. Um, Twitter posts, of course, posts that are often imbued with a feeling of both uh, uh, tragedy as well as anger, or sometimes expressing the view that humans are only getting what we deserve. And this defeatism is uh, really endemic amongst uh, Generation Z, those born between 1990 and the 2000s. Uh, you would, might have seen the uh, results of a survey of 10,000 young people around the world who show that three quarters believe that the future is frightening and 56% agree that, quote, humanity is doomed. And if you think about that, that's an astonishing and disturbing figure. Over half of young people think humanity is doomed. Among scholars, uh, the popular bestseller, uh, How Everything Can Collapse by Pablo Savine and Raphael Stevens, the French scholars, warned of uh, imminent civilizational collapse. And they admitted that as scholars, uh, their, this catastrophism that they were writing about was kind of embarrassing for them. But they felt it was no more than a confrontation with the truth. Beyond bestsellers like that, scholars have been grappling uh, with the problem of rupture. And I made the case uh, for a rupture in Defiant Earth and was critical of those who found ways to normalise the Anthropocene by uh, absorbing it into comfortable ways of thinking. In fact, in a recent uh, email exchange uh, with uh, Agostino uh, Serra, uh, an Italian scholar whom I'll talk about later, I realised that I was actually writing about three kinds of rupture. Uh, an epistemic rupture in earth scientists with the emergence of earth system science in the 1980s and 90s, uh, an article um, I wrote uh, with, a, uh, with a colleague um, about that. Uh, secondly, a, a um, biophysical rupture in the way the Earth system itself functions. And that has both an ontic aspect and an ontological aspect, which I talked about the injection of human will into the functioning of uh, the Earth system. And thirdly, a historical rupture, meaning not just a radical break in human history, but also a shift, and this is thanks to Dupesh Chakrabarti's insights, a shift in how human history can no longer be considered a purely human affair. I think the first rupture, the epistemic one, made, us, made it possible to see the, the second, the, the actual change in the functioning of the Earth system, and, and, and both of those made it possible to see the his, rupture in history that, that uh, I just uh, uh, mentioned. Well, much of the disagreement, I think, and dispute among scholars over the Anthropocene and the social sciences and the humanities 
boils down to the use of terms. Many of us have been using terms like technology, world, earth, um, at cross purposes. Um, so for me, let me just briefly say that I use earth with a lowercase e as something like nature, understood as the arena in which local or regional uh, ecosystem um, uh, aspects of the of the earth as a whole appear. I use Earth capital E uh, in, in two ways. One reflect the ontic and ontological. Um, ontically, it's the object of Earth system science. That is the planet comprising all of its bio uh, geophysical spheres, a dynamic whole subject to scientific analysis. But in my second usage of Earth with capital E, uh, it's that which resists all totalization and rationalization which always uh, retains its otherness. And as such, it presents attempts to enframe it, that is to regard it, analyze it, and use it uh, merely as a collection of resources. The earth has always resisted totalization, but it's only in the Anthropocene that this defiance has become really apparent. Those who set out to master the earth uh, have brought out the unconquerable conquerable element of the earth as a whole. What about uh, the term world? Well, in Defined Earth, uh, I was, um, as I think um, Vincent has pointed out, uh, I was a bit um, unclear in how I used the term. Um, I wrote that um, we become human in worlds of social and material practices, including collective identity formation, uh, language, understandings of nature, and the relations of humans to the natural world. So everything we do and think occurs within worlds of lived experience, which are, of course, embedded in material environments. So the worlds we inhabit impart meaning to our lives. They become, actually, uh, modes of being. I resist the use of the of world with a capital W. As soon as we... And this is perhaps one of the most important lessons I learned from uh, the late and very lamented Bruno Latour. As soon as we capitalize things in our minds, uh, whether it be world, uh, science, society, history, God, uh, or if they are regarded as capital letters, they start pulling strings from someplace above us, uh, treating us like puppets controlled by world or uh, science or history or God. And that's why I'm suspicious of any technology with a capital T. Instead of being simply the aggregation of technologies at work in the world, technology with a capital T takes on a life of its own, a force that stands outside of and above small t technologies and humans and manipulates them. However, in an extremely interesting paper, uh, Vincent uh, writes of the Anthropocene world, world with a capital uh, W, which he says appears as global interior milieu in which humanity and the natural environment become intertwined, an interior milieu. So he explains that a storm is no longer just a storm, it's a manifestation of Earth in a human transformed climate. And I like this formulation because it points to the way the Anthropocene climate is changing our interior milieu, which I understand in his usage to be our disposition towards the world outside of us. But I think capitalizing world reduces the power of Vincent's idea because it makes the thing it describes seem abstract and above or outside of us rather than within us. Perhaps uh, Vincent can comment on that later on. I've argued that the advent of the Anthropocene is a break in history. Humans become entangled inseparably from the Earth system, so that, as uh, uh, Earth system scientists have said, the fate of one determines the fate of the other. And as Deepesh, uh, Deepesh uh, Chakrabarti wrote, Historical sensibility itself is lost, has lost its purchase on the future. So let me now consider various responses to the claim that I and others make that the Anthropocene represents 
a rupture in the census, I mean, or at least one of them. Let me talk first about what I call deflationary normalization. Incorporation of the Anthropocene into pre existing ways of understanding the process of history have the effect of removing the Anthropocene sting. Interpreting it not as a rupture, but as another stage in a familiar historical process, various social scientists have seen it not as a challenge, but as a confirmation, even a vindication of the belief systems that they've always held. When social scientists read the new event using these entrenched ideas, the present and the future are written back into the past. So there's no break, no rupture, only continuity, which in my view renders the warnings made by climate and earth system scientists less threatening. Consequently, the contours of the problem are changed into more recognizable and comfortable ones. Usually, although not always, serious engagement with earth system science is avoided and the general disdain in some parts of social science and humanities for the natural sciences is affirmed once again. This strategy is particularly evident amongst scholars of the left who read the Anthropocene as no more than a stage in the history of class struggle and colonialism. Some, like John Bellamy Foster, find destruction of nature to be no more than the second contradiction, as he calls it, of capitalism, alongside the original exploitation of labour which is already present, of course, uh, in, sorry, the, the second contradiction. If you look carefully enough in the canonical text, as he has, then you'll find it there. You'll find the Anthropocene in uh, Das Kapital, or perhaps a philosophical manuscript. Christoph Bonneuil dissects the narratives that have been used to explain the Anthropocene from the naturalist and the post-naturalist to the eco-catastrophist and the eco-Marxist. He criticizes the naturalism of earth, of earth system science for using the generic anthropos to obscure the social fractures built into environmental disruption, overlooking quote, unequal social, racial, gender, and geopolitical relation, uh, relations. This, of course, is the kind of first and foremost criticism of social scientists on the left of the notion of the Anthropocene. And Christoph claims the natural scientific narrative encodes science's hidden agenda of world government. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that he's saying that, um, which has to be a surprise to the earth system scientists I know. Uh, Jason Moore's capital Ocene, extremely popular uh, on the left, locates the new effort within the history of industrial capitalism and class struggle, thereby depriving the Anthropocene um, of its novelty. The effect of the idea of the Capitalocene is to pacify the Anthropocene by knowing it, by familiarising it, by taking it out of the earth and putting it into the world as just the latest stage of capitalism in which the struggle for social justice continues uh, albeit at a higher level. Now, it may be beneficial for one's radical credentials, but reading everything solely in terms of one group of humans dominating others avoids the truly difficult and confronting nature of the new dispensation. Now, I've recently come across, um, not surprisingly, because it's extremely new, uh, uh, an ex exceptionally interesting new book by the Hungarian historian Zoltán Baldassar Simon, probably not the correct pronunciation, Simon maybe, Simon. Um, now, Simon uh, very cleverly distills in a few words the deflationary effect of treating the Anthropocene rupture as just another event in the processes of history, uh, what he calls processual history. And I quote from him, he writes, inasmuch as the Anthropocene appears as, as unprecedented, it does not have a processual history. And inasmuch 
as it has a processual history, it is not the Anthropocene. I think that's spot on. Simon, however, has an extremely broad definition of processual history. It encompasses for him any narrative humans have developed to understand historical processes. Every narrative, he argues, comes from the past and therefore no narrative is capable of shedding light on the Anthropocene, which is, un which is he agrees, unprecedented. He writes, the sheer act of telling Anthropocene narratives is in conflict with the necessity of recognising the novelty of the situation. Um, um, okay, so I'm sorry, he, he made that argument. I, I got a bit mixed up here. In an article he wrote uh, uh, in the European Journal of Social Theory uh, in 2020. So it was only, I guess, uh, a matter of time uh, before someone entered this vigorous debate over competing narratives for the Anthropocene, uh, which uh, Christophe Bernoulli had set out very well a few years ago, to declare that narrative telling as such is wrong-headed. The Anthropocene, he says, is such a radical event that it is outside all history and therefore all narratives. Although I was one of the first to declare uh, the Anthropocene to be a radical rupture, dividing both human history and Earth history into a time before and a time after, and I was uh, the first, I think, to criticise scholars for deflating the Anthropocene by reading it through their traditional disciplinary lenses. Simon says that I too am guilty in the fight Earth of resorting to anachronistic storytelling in order to make sense of the Anthropocene. In Defiant Earth, I have called for a new, quote, narrative of narratives, one founded on, and here I quote from Defiant Earth, uh, this comment, this kind of declaration, above all of the diversity among narratives stand one global economy, one global culture, one total Earth. If the Anthropocene performs this unexpected and unwelcome unification of humankind, then it invites us to formulate a story of humankind, a narrative explanation of the progress of human history as a whole. Now, in response to this, Simon uh, makes the following comment. There can hardly be a clear indication of the intricacies and per perplexities of the Anthropocene predicament and the fact that even those who claim, that's me, the radical novelty of the Anthropocene cannot but have a recourse to inherited schemes in their efforts to make sense of it, thereby trivialising and domesticating their own insights. Ouch, was my immediate thought when I read that. The um, radical emptiness of the box marked stories of the Anthropocene is, Simon says, the fundamental paradox of our current understanding of the Anthropocene. And I can only agree with him that making sense of the new epic is, quote, the greatest challenge, intellectually, because we must somehow make sense of what he calls that which appears to defy our familiar ways of sense making. However, if all past stories and ideas are redundant, what are we to do? Simon says he can think of no way out of this, what he called catch-22, but he's not willing uh, to accept defeat. It's the greatest challenge to solve this puzzle. So if all familiar ways of sense-making must fail, then we can only resort to unfamiliar ways of sense-making. What can it mean to cast off all previous ways of thinking about humans and human history to understand a radically new dispensation it can mean only one thing. Someone has to have an epiphany. And this is a way out that I actually want to take seriously. It would mean that someone uh, would need to uh, enter into the deepest kind of meditative state, Buddha-like, and hope without hoping that something entirely new emerges out of nothing. That is, emerges spontaneously out of a consciousness that's cast off all ideas, 
concepts, beliefs, stories. In other words, leaving behind thinking as such and merging with, had lots of names through the centuries, merging with what might be called the noumenon, cosmic consciousness, or perhaps the otherness of the earth itself. In the Heidegger's terms, it would be an aridness emerging out of being with capital B. I'm open to that. In fact, I might give it a go myself. Uh, on the other hand, an alternative response to Zoltan Simon's repudiation of all narratives might, meet it, might be to go one up on him. We might ask him, uh, after your call to banish all familiar ways of sense making, why do you feel that making sense of the Anthropocene remains the greatest challenge? Aren't you just the captive of the urge to tell stories, to invent narrative, to make sense of the world? Why not just let it all go? Don't stress about the emptiness of the box. Forget about the box. Now, it's true that if you were to take this path, and it's tempting, you would have to resign from your job as an academic, but there are certainly more tranquil and useful ways to spend a life. There are, these are, I think, radical but not crazy responses to Zoltan's challenge, but I think there might be a way forward that doesn't require us to resign from our jobs or retreat to a zendo. Old concepts and the older the better, repurposed for new situations can become new concepts, shaping new stories. For our dilemma, I think raiding the ancient bank of theology may hold promise for understanding the Anthropocene. Now, as it happens, uh, there's a uh, new edited volume came out a few months ago on the theological significance of the Anthropocene. Uh, it's called theology on a defiant earth and in it the contributors consider three concepts drawn from the bible a holocene text but going back two or three thousand years three concepts that have salience for us i think apocalypse eschatology and sin um i'll consider each briefly uh looking at the uh, three of the chapters from this book. The biblical scholar David Neville reimagines the notion of apocalypse in the Anthropocene, noting first that the common use of the term to describe a catastrophic event is not the meaning found in biblical literature. There, in biblical literature, apocalypse denotes an unveiling or a disclosure. Uh, what he says is discernment of the divine disclosure and hope of divine deliverance. In other words, apocalypse is a vision of reality beyond the mundane and empirical that is informed by insights from a non-mundane domain that is usually inaccessible. From a secular standpoint, this can be understood, I think, as the ontic informed by ontological intuitions. Apocalypse, suggests David Neville, is a resource for understanding the inbreaking of the future. For Christians, the inbreaking is the Christ event. For some secular scholars, and I'm drawn to this idea, it's a future under a transformed climate breaking into the present. The second concept uh, dealt with in the book is uh, by Christian Mostert, a professor of systematic theology, who considers what thinking eschatologically means in the Anthropocene. Eschatology denotes <clears throat> last things, understood as, he writes, a decisive discontinuity within the course of a historical event. It means, he writes, not only thinking about the future, but also from the future. 
isn't that precisely what we who philosophize about the Anthropocene are trying to do? Except the future event comes not from the transcendent realm, but from the climatologist charts or from the meaningful anticipation of breaches of planetary boundaries, extending even to the concrete possibility of human extinction. It's a reckoning with an ultimate future, anticipating that everything will be transformed and for Christians renewed. And so Mustard writes of eschatological thinking, it undermines illusions about existing structures and arrangements, about justice and progress, human rationality and benevolence. It's a standing reminder that brokenness, alienation, apathy and evil characterise and determine the fabric of human sociality and political arrangements. I'm into that. On sin, the Girardian theologian, Scott Cowdell, writes that beyond mere morality, sin represents a constriction and deformation of our personhood. It has an otherworldly quality embedded in the system, systemic nature of reality. Beyond its transcendent quality, it also names culpability. And so in another chapter, the public theology scholar uh, Peter Walker excoriates church leaders for their anodyne, uh, for their feeble responses uh, to human uh, enhanced disasters like fires and floods. They, these church leaders, bishops and so on, call for prayer and care, uh, yet they refuse to describe as evil the actions of those responsible for climate change, and they will not name the abuse of the earth as a sin. Returning now to the secular, that's food for thought, I think. The book, although it's one of these hugely expensive hardbacks, uh, is worth you know, getting in some format. Um, and reading if you're at least interested in being stimulated by much of it. Returning now to the secular realm, uh, although I think what I just talked about has a, 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 a cognate secular interpretation, obviously, in a very important and stimulating new book just out uh, right now, uh, the Italian philosopher Agostino Serra reimagines the Anthropocene as what he calls the Technocene, a construct he uses to repudiate arguments for the Anthropocene as rupture, including my argument. Uh, and he argues in favour of a uh, continuous interpretation. Um, the book is called A Philosophical Journey into the Anthropocene. Fabulous, fabulous book, I think. Now, in his interpretation of the Anthropocene as Technocene, the Anthropocene comes, and this is a bit hard to get your head around, um, quote, uh, an epistemic hyperobject with a geohistorical barycenter. Now, I had to look it up, I have to say, a barycenter is the rotational center of two or more orbiting bodies when weighted by their masses. Um, so, um, it's a concept, concept, I think, that sits quite oddly with the idea of a hyperobject. Now, since a hyperobject is not an object, it's not a thing, but a conceptualization of a phenomenon. According to Timothy Morton, it has certain properties, five of them, but we can't quite put a finger on it. Nevertheless, um, for Sarah, the technocene is the explication and fulfillment of all modernity. He writes that the new epic, which is in fact not a new epic, um, quote, embodies the age of technology, not that of the human being, and is the culmination of our idolatry of technology. And he began his investigation at the place where most philosophy of technology seems to begin, and that is Heidegger's question concerning technology, where technology takes on its life as a mode of appropriating the world. Interpreted this way, the Anthropocene is not, 
uh, as I and others claim, a rupture in human history or earth history, but a continuation of pre-existing trends, that is the creep of enframing across the earth. The philosophy of the Anthropocene becomes a philosophy of technology and the Anthropocene becomes the Technocene. I think that it's at this point that the phenomenon and the concept of the Anthropocene slip out of stratigraphy and into human history and philosophy. It's only by shifting its epistemic field that the Technocene thesis can be sustained. It becomes a hyper object where I constantly go back to the things themselves, so to speak, and especially the ontic violence of the earth system, the floods, fires, storms, and droughts. And uh, as a result, uh, I'm accused of scientism. Sarah's technocene thesis is a sophisticated uh, philosophical intervention, and I can't do justice to its scope and subtlety here. However, however, focusing on what seemed to me to be the essential elements, Sarah's conception of the technocene gives rise to what he called, called humankind's omnipower. That is, human power grown to the point where our, quote, agency becomes a decisive condition for the possibility for the destiny of the earth, even from a geological perspective. The accumulation of uh, technological power uh, is on a continuum, so that the existence or otherwise of the anthropocenic golden spike is by the by. Doesn't matter, it's not important. It's the technological omnipower of humans and nothing stratigraphic that defines the anthropocene as technocene. And with this move, Sarah shifts the focus from the earth back to the human and then away from a rupture in human history, a la Chakrabarti, who had that Heideggerian process of continuously expanding techno power. Now, as I worked on what would become Defiant Earth, I had what I thought of was my big breakthrough. Um, after three years or something of trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And much of my analysis flowed from it. And it was a realization that while humans have become vastly more powerful, this doesn't mean that the Earth's power has been eclipsed. In fact, the Earth's power has increased, if we mean by the Earth's power, its ability to thwart our plans and overwhelm our techno power. And this I call the antinomy of the Anthropocene. Humans are so powerful, we now rival the great forces of nature, yet at the same time, the forces of nature have been roused from their Holocene slumber so that we enter a long era in which they are more dangerous and for us much more uncontrollable. Humans are more powerful, nature is more powerful. But the power of nature will always prevail. So while Sarah sees human technological agency as all powerful, I argue that human power has met its match as in framing reaches its apotheosis with plans for geoengineering, planetary engineering, human techno power comes up against an untamable and uncontrollable earth. Whatever may be the case at a local level, the earth as a whole can't be a resource to be mastered. It is not standing reserve. Our power is ultimately incomplete. So that the advent of the Anthropocene, the awakening of the giant, marks a discontinuity in, in framing. The more humans push their techno power, the more blowback we'll experience from the Earth's power. And so the continuity thesis is discontinued. When Sarah writes that with our technological omnipower, the future of nature is now literally in our hands, I'm reminded of Marx's famous dictum, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. For me, we might say humans make their own history, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the Earth. More succinctly, in the words of the four leading Earth system scientists, the fate of one determines the fate of the other.
right. <coughs> going into the last section of this talk, <coughs> which is about Earth's otherness. Despite my critique of Sarah's conception of omnipower, we share an understanding that's perhaps more foundational, a conviction that nature uh, possesses an inescapable otherness. We see a cosmological difference between the world of humans and Earth. We appear to agree with Heidegger in a, uh, a statement that I really like and which often comes to me. The world grounds itself on the Earth and the Earth juts through world. For me, this captures the ontological event of the Anthropocene, a violent jutting through of Earth. We are both disturbed by the way various social science scholars annihilate the difference between world and earth. Sarah wants, quite rightly, quote, to make a distinction between an ontological level and an ontic level of the Anthropocene, with an analysis uh, at the formal level, permitting consideration of an anthropological and cosmological universalism. That is, at an ontological level, and this is where we fully agree, we can consider um, an anthropological and cosmological universalism, whereas, of course, at an ontic level, we can go back to political, social, cultural difference and power relations among humans. So after the ontic, in defined earth, after the ontic foundations are put in place, the book is explicitly a reflection on the ontological implications for both anthropos in general and, more speculatively, the earth itself. To me, the advent of the Anthropocene means that the otherness of the Earth, the enchanted Earth, or unintelligible, as Kant uh, would say, self-secluding, in Heidegger's uh, terms, um, the invisible uh, remainder, uh, in Schelling's phrase, uh, the enchanted Earth now reverberates, juts through into the ontic world as catastrophic climate change. But Sarah uh, and I diverge on what this other means. For me, it's something like Schelling's indivisible remainder, what's left when all human measurement, assessment, evaluation, and modeling is finished. It's the orneriness of Wally Brocker's ornery beast, the angriness of the angry summer, the revenge of the vengeful Gaia. For Sarah, Sarah, as I read him, Otherness is carried out as a human project, something that is a kind of experience beyond the logical or rational, a bit like, or it compares it to falling in love. Although he begins by mentioning the sacredness of nature, he swerves away in his discussion uh, from the otherness of the earth, uh, returning to human questions and our difference from others. I couldn't find a sense of the otherness of the earth, of the earth itself, to understand where he saw the indivisible remainder that nature always holds back from our gaze, from our logic, from our instruments and our models. His presence has become more manifest with the advent of the Anthropocene. And for me, this is the problem that explains why, although Sarah and I agree profoundly on certain things, we disagree at a basic epistemological level. For him, it seems to me, the Anthropocene as Technocene represents the attainment of technological omnipower by humans, whereas for me, the Anthropocene represents the change in the Earth itself. So, the essential argument, I'll finish on this point, um, in Sarah's book, namely that using our technological omnipower to care for the planet, the conceptualization of the planet uh, increasingly as uh, a living entity and that which therefore needs our care or stewardship. He makes what I think is a brilliant uh, argument that this becomes management of the earth and therefore a form of well-meaning domination. As a consequence of this, caretaking turns into a hidden form of will to power. With a shift from the objectification of the earth as standing reserve, as per the economics text, 
to its subjectification as a living being in the shape of Gaia in some form, instead of aspiring to be lords of the earth, enlightened humans have become stewards of the earth system or planetary managers. In other words, nature becomes entirely dependent on us, uh, for which we are totally responsible. In short, if nature is alive, we must take care of it, we must treat the earth as we would treat our pet. And I think this is a, a superb characterization of a certain strand of thinking about the earth. And there are more and more of these, what I might call petifiers, treating, considering the earth as a, our pet. Our humans are stewards of the earth with the responsibility to manage and take care of it. And in this group, we might include eco modernists, enlightened capitalists, civil society groups stretching from school children through pale green environmental groups and Pope Francis himself. But against this ethics of stewardship are counter powerful countervailing forces. I don't think uh, fossil fuel executives or the finance media or Davos habitues um, ha have abandoned the mastery project. Uh, the system as a whole doesn't or appear to have changed from mastery and on the other hand, outflanking the petrifiers from the darker shades of green, and I've put myself there, there are many who don't view the earth as a passive victim, a living creature that can be tamed as our pet. They, we, see humankind's overwhelming responsibility for destruction and believe it's not nature that needs taming, but us. We grieve for nature lost, and like existential defeatists, we have no illusions about techno power or Earth's willingness to become our companion animal. I'll leave it there and look forward to questions and discussion. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Clive, for that very interesting um, lecture in which I think a lot of the themes that we also saw two months ago and that we a lot of us have been working on for a long time, whether it's Earth versus world, whether it's the status of science versus uh, ontology, whether it's this notion of the event that I think you really draw out in an interesting theological, um, along theological trajectories here. Uh, I think these are still, uh, yeah, very, uh, very timely. So thank you very much for uh, that. Let me um, give the floor to Bronislav. Uh, I will add a spotlight to you so everybody can see you because you prepared uh, a response to this, after which we will open the floor for Q&A. Like I said at the beginning, uh, you can use the chat for this already. You can start typing and I will try and do some uh, moderation there. Uh, Brony, uh, please go ahead. Okay. All right. I'll assume you can see and hear me if I don't hear otherwise. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so. Thanks very much uh, to Joachim and Vincent for inviting me to uh, respond to Clive. And uh, uh, yeah, it's great to have an opportunity uh, to engage with Clive's thinking. It's been a few years since uh, we've had a conversation about these matters, and it's uh, it's 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 uh, I'm, I'm um, yeah, this is a superb opportunity. And a kind of, it, this will be a kind of trailer for my own talk in this series as well, which is, I think, scheduled for the 9th of May. Um, inevitably, some of the, um, uh, you know, Clive has uh, stimulated and touched on a lot of the sort of themes that uh, I'm likely to to talk about myself. I, I, I do, I mean, first of all, I'm kind of starting off with the, Definitely the points of agreement, you know, which are kind of unsurprising in in some ways, given that, uh, you know, Clive and I have talked about these things for a number of years now. I mean, I certainly very much applaud Clive's emphasis in the book, the Defiant Earth book, and also in this um, talk on Anthropocene's rupture on the importance of uh, of not deflating the challenge of the Anthropocene you know so Nigel Clark and I published a book um, a couple of years ago called Planetary Social Thought and the subtitle is something like the Anthropocene challenge to the social sciences although you could include the humanities in that as well 
that was a sort of publisher's title in a way. And, and certainly what we're arguing in the book is that there is a serious challenge here and that scholars in the social sciences and humanities, even though they've been really, uh, it's been incredibly stimulating the way they have, um, they, we as a community have engaged with the Anthropocene and taken it up as a sort of stimulus for new thinking. Nevertheless, I agree with Clive that scholars have been too quick to refract the Anthropocene, you know, in the sort of Newtonian sense of splitting it up into its constituent colours <laughs> through existing subdisciplinary paradigms and um, political and uh, socio-political um, intellectual modes of thinking. Um, and what we, uh, Nigel and I do in our book is sort of argue that certainly our colleagues have often been too quick to sort of skate over the details of what the earth sciences have been telling us for the last half century really uh, about this planet we live on and the opportunities we have the, the, this these thinking about and through the earth gives us for extending uh, rather than um uh neutralizing the kind of critical our uh, critical capabilities of understanding what's happening to the earth at the moment um it's interesting that clive uh, you um are emphasizing this idea of the earth as otherness this sort of ontological otherness i think that's really stimulating the way you you do that and i was just thinking um about the similarities and differences between that the earth as other in your sort of Heideggerian framing and what Nigel and I talk ab uh, about as planetary multiplicity, which is one of the key concepts in our book, Planetary Social Thought, because um, there are similarities and differences, you know, this idea that the Earth is um, uh, is it sort of can't be subsumed under a sort of single um, grasp of the human mind or whatever. Um, but the way we talk about planetary multiplicity, which is very much informed by the Earth sciences, if you like, the understanding of our planet as this um, assemblage, which is self-othering um, on all spatial and temporal scales. You know, it's a far from equilibrium system that's constantly uh, out of step with itself, to use the language of Gilbert Simondon. So, Whereas you say nature do, uh, holds back from our gaze and our instruments, I think we're also arguing that nature, the earth, planetary being, planetary um, multiplicity, involves the planet also withholding from itself. It presents problems to its parts. It's out of step with itself. It's, it, it divides itself into parts that are that are, that um, are constantly having to find solutions to the problems that that planetary existence gives it to, to itself. So I think it's a, in a way, our understanding of planetary multiplicity is similar, but it's more kind of imminent and it's more multiple. It's not like one, you know, that the earth is other to us. It's a sort of otherness and in her internal difference in a sort of Deleuzean, more Deleuzean mode, which is kind of um, fractured throughout the whole planet and, you know, creates all the drive of, of, of planetary uh, self-organisation. Um, I also really like uh, in the, in your book the way you, you know, this kind of key insight that you describe in your talk, you know, that um, the Anthropocene is an age in which both humans have agency, but also nature has agency. And I think that is a really important uh, contribution. And again, thinking about that, how that is similar and different to what we argue in our book, um, we say uh, our understanding of human agency is that it always involves combining powers with as it were, the power and agency and potentiality of non-human forces. So whether it's something like uh, metallurgy or uh, ceramics or weaving or agriculture or or um, hunting and gathering and foraging and or even the use of fossil fuels, humans have all, always un having to understand the natural tendencies of the parts of the earth. Um, and to, as it were, coax them over thresholds and 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 um, 
uh, di direct them while never fully controlling them. And here, I suppose, my own thinking is very much influenced by the book, uh, The Control of Nature, which is an ironic title, uh, by John McPhee, where he talks about uh, trying to tame the Mississippi or to channel lava flows and how um, it's as much the lava flows are choreographing humans as humans are choreographing the lava flows. You have to learn how to think like a lava flow in order to control it. And um, I, and I think, yeah, there are, I'm going to have to move on a bit quicker, I think, to, to get my, ten, in, uh, my thoughts in the 10 minutes. Um, but I think... Um, there's something there when you use Agostino Serra's idea of pettification, um, which is a really, you know, I, I get, I agree that Agostino's book is really important and really uh, interesting to think through. Um, but when, if we think uh, about um, the understanding of nature and relationship with uh, the natural world and non-human world of indigenous peoples who start from a, a kind of inherently social understanding of nature, you know, that even um, hunting and foraging are kind of understood in terms of a kind of social exchange rather than a purely technological exchange, uh, you know, a social exchange with non-human living things, but also with spirits and uh, uh, keepers of the game and things like that. I think um, a lot of those questions about what it means to treat nature as uh, in a non-technological way, you know, there's a whole other set of registers I think we can draw on. I just wanted to also say something about uh, your use of Zoltan Simon's uh, argument about narrative, and I, I hadn't come across uh, his work before, and it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've thought for a while about um, narrative and whether we need to move beyond narrating <laughs> the world to make it meaningful. And I, and I certainly have had some thoughts about the way that narrative is a mode of sense making, which is, makes a lot of sense for animals like ourselves, you know, who have a front and a back and move through the world and through time in this kind of like um, purposeful uh, way that we've evolved to do, uh, which tends to lend itself to a, a to a sort of linear, um, temporal sort of narrative, you know, with a earlier and a later that corresponds to the back and the front of the human body. Um, but nevertheless, I do think um, I'm I, I'm not convinced yet that um, that it's a complete paradox, a self undermine paradox to have a narrative about the end of narrative you know if if our if there's something radically new about the anthropocene i still think that human language and human narration has the capacity to um to make sense of that because of course human language is recursive I and mean, it's a good example in your own talk you know um so Christoph Bonnet's four narratives that he uh, analysis of the Anthropocene that he published in 2015. So the Anthropocene discourse up to that time, you know, he could decompose into these four different narratives. And now, of course, you're placing his placing of narratives within his narrative within your narrative, you know. Uh, and now I'm placing your narrative um, that you presented half an hour ago in mine. And of course narrative works like that by building on but also breaking other people's narratives and interestingly you know your use of uh, re reference to the bible it reminded me i think it was gerhard von rad the great exegesist of the of genesis um who points out that when um the the um genesis was put together as a text using stories that were circulating around like the flood and the creation of, uh, uh, of humans out of the natural world that were circulating around the Middle Eastern um, uh, region at that time, uh, they did something very profound in that they, they uh, assembled them with these breaks in them uh, that actually, um, as it were, made it possible to think about human history as something that's separate from cosmic history, you know, which is one of the great sort of 
um, inventions, if you like, of of of, um, of Judaism. Um, so there's lots of examples of the way that actually a break in the narrative is, is actually been used to you know express cosmic ideas and things like that. Um, so I think there's lots of uh, ways we can, uh, as it were, break narratives and talk about breaks in narratives in a narrative way to 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 express complex ideas. And um, just to finish on one last thought, I suppose um, about yeah, you quote uh, in, in your in your little section on theology of uh, the Anthropocene, which is really interesting. And you quote Christian Mostert about eschatology as about not just thinking about the future, but also thinking from the future. And it reminds me of two things. One is um, the work of uh, Barbara Adam and Chris Groves in their Future Matters book, where they uh, talk about the future present as a sort of mode of engaging with the future, which is as it were, from the future point of view. And they talk about, as it were, the paradoxes involved in doing that, where you're trying to think from the point of view of future people for, uh, whose interests and whose worldviews and whose experience you don't know anything about. So there's a, there's a kind of, um, uh, has to be a certain kind of humility about thinking from the future. Um, but it also reminds me of something that Nigel and I uh, talk about in our book, which is about the, the need to think through the planet rather than just about the planet you know by engaging with the way the, pl the planet as it were interrogates itself and it's not just a an object of human thought but it does strike me that this language you use at the end of epiphany of eschatology and sin and so on is very what you might call axial age thinking about the sacred and about other non-human agencies you know to use the term of Carl Jaspers to describe that sort of uh, constellation of thought that includes Christianity, Judaism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, Greek philosophy that emerges in the half cent half a millennium before um, the birth of Christ. And I think there are also other resources that are already appearing around the earth, you know, what Marisol de la Cadena call calls earth, earth beings, or we, we call earth oriented agencies, which are you know, as it were, personifications of mountains and rivers and, and forests, you know, that are already becoming politically um, uh, salient, particularly in Latin American countries, but more broadly. And, it, and it, it feels as if whenever the earth is passing through a threshold, these other, these other kind of agencies, um, which may map onto what we think of as humans, you know, such as climate scientists issuing warnings, uh, but may not, may also appear as storms and uh, and mountains and uh, things like that, um, are already Brony. giving us new register to thinking. Brony, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I think it's important that Clive has the opportunity to respond and that we also have other people to, to uh, raise a question. So can you so maybe finish. Um, finish your, your question so that we also can continue with the discussion? Sorry for yeah, this, but finished. yeah, no, finished. Please go ahead, Clive. Well, I mean, that's uh, kind of a bunch of mind blowing ideas that I have to kind of sit down and think about. Thanks, uh, Brian. I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, I don't really know how to respond on, on the, the theological stuff. I just want to say that. Um, you know, like all of us, I'm kind of casting around for concepts, ideas, ways of understanding that might help us come to grips with this extraordinary situation in which we find ourselves. And because, you know, kind of by historical accident, I, I'm in a building where I rub shoulders with theologians, I guess I've become, uh, you know, very open-minded, you know, fascinating intellectuals. I've become more, more open to uh, thinking about uh, or trying to engage uh, with how they would see uh, the Anthropocene. So it just, and since since they talk about rupture, I mean, the interesting, th interesting thing about Christian theology is that for well, the history of, of the world in the Christian story, it has a beginning and an end, but you get kind of no middle. Um, 
and uh, and 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 you know we we as historians, amateur or professional, you know we have a middle to 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 fill it out. Um, but nevertheless, the you know it's the beginning and the end that that are really interesting right now because we're faced with a, an, an end time uh, of some kind and possibly you know, a new beginning. I'm not saying it could be a good new beginning, it could be a disastrous new beginning, but nevertheless, it's this trying to explore the notion of rupture, which is what uh, Christians do, Christian theologians do with their notion of um, the inbreaking of, uh, of an event. And of course, very much within the what might broadly be called the mystical tradition, um, out of which um, European philosophy grew. I mean, you know, if you think about Kant dividing the world into the phenomenal and the noumenal, he was basically saying, well, I'm going to put everything mystical and religious aside in this noumenal and, and declare that we can say nothing about it. And then uh, that was accepted. Uh, by similar kind of uh, philosophers, whether they were religious practicing Christians or not. Uh, and then you had Schopenhauer came along and said, well, no, actually, there is a way to access the noumenon. Um, and it's all there in the, in the text of the East uh, and indeed in the mystical works of um, uh, Christianity in the West. And so I think that this is uh, something that we ought not to ignore. That's something we ought to explore, because um, there's no doubt that uh, thinking about the point that we're at in purely secular terms, in rationalistic terms, in other ways, um, is se severely limited in trying to understand the radical nature of of the dispensation we find ourselves in. I think I'll just leave it at that. There's a lot more. I will say. When I think about it more, but that's it for the moment. Thanks. I'm really keen to hear what other people have to say. All right. Thank you very much. And I'm sure this conversation can also continue uh, in two months when Bronislav himself will um, present uh, here. Clive, you're, of course, more than welcome to join us then as well. I hope that the time zone differences will uh, permit it. Um, yeah, Vincent just wrote in the chat that due to management issues, unfortunately, has to leave. But um, so let's maybe skip his question, uh, although you invited him during your lecture to um, uh, uh, to do so, but maybe skip that for a later uh, time as well. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and go to um, uh, Martin Bolus uh, question, um, uh, which is also in the chat, Clive. I don't know if you can uh, see it. Um, so I will briefly just read through it and then maybe you can respond and then um, uh, Martin can can reply at once if he likes. So he states that the various interpretations of the Anthropocene seem to find its echo in geological communities when they debate, debate Anthropocene as a suite of events. For example, some officers in the IUGS, quaternary scientists and eco-modernists, versus Anthropocene as a new epoch. So the majority of um, Earth science, Earth science, uh, Earth system scientists. Apologies. Um, <coughs> And uh, you yourself uh, as well, I would uh, think. So the question is, can you situate this debate? And then uh, Martin, please feel free to uh, respond um, after Clive has responded. Yeah, thank you. I, I find this, thanks for the question, sir. It's a really fascinating issue. And I have to say that, you know, my whole notion of rupture was really, I got it from the Earth System scientists uh, uh, in particular, Jan Zalasiewicz and you know the Will Stefan who sadly died um, a month or so ago uh, greatly missed. Um, you know my understanding comes directly from those guys um, uh, and my reliance on them, uh, the scientists that is, uh, without trying to interpret, uh, reread, shift, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, is very much due to uh, my um, um, uh, uh, what I call my strategic positivism, which is you know my view, having spent fifteen years uh, battling climate science deniers. You know, I take the view that we as social scientists have an obligation not to challenge science 
in its fundamental course, we read it, interpret it, and explain and 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 put it in a different context. And so, um, my notion uh, of, of rupture, in fact, whenever I write, for example, in the, the rupture paper, paper I wrote uh, in the Anthropocene Review a few years ago, you know, I'd send it to Will and to Jan and say, "Is this right?" If they say, "No, you've got this wrong," I'll change it. Um, so. Then there is the debate you're referring to, or dispute, Martin, within the uh, earth science community. Uh, and that's a, you know, it's a very messy one because what earth system science is doing <coughs> is actually challenging geology at a very fundamental level. And saying geology and stratigraphy is really just a sub-branch of earth system science. And geologists don't like that, or some don't. Of course, Jan Zalasiewicz is paid up, straight up geologist, as he often said. But some of them, uh, you know, uh, don't like to be told that uh, their discipline is is being absorbed into a uh, a broader one uh, relating to changing the function of the Earth system uh, as a whole. So I think there's a kind of really interesting historical struggle within the Earth sciences uh, that's going on. But you know, there's no doubt in my mind having. Not that I'm a, a historian of science, uh, but my friend Jacques Greinewald, with whom I wrote a uh, paper about rupture, is. And, uh, you know, there's no doubt in my mind where the, the weight of the evidence lies, and that is with the, with the, with the wills and the yarns uh, who are talking about the Anthropocene as a rupture in the function of the Earth system. Right, thank you. Um, Martin, would you like to reply to this? Yes, I would uh, like to uh, thank for, 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 for the comment. I'm by education a physical oceanographer, so I sit naturally more with the earth system science uh, history. And from a philosophical point of view, I see far more the rupture. Uh, as the sequence of events uh, which I argue to go back about 50,000 years in time. I have an interest in to try to understand the processes which are going on. So when I look on the geological community, I see definitely they are, sorry, pissed off because an outsider made a proposal in their domain. And uh, Jan Salasiewicz made a fantastic job over 15 years to bring two different worlds together and to build a, to build a majority. So looking from outside on the, in the last uh, 12 months, re-erupted debate about uh, events, sequence of events versus epoch, uh, looks very much like as a, a battle to avoid taking a decision soon in the geological community. And what I definitely do not understand, I uh, would like to find an answer, uh, is the following. Jan, in the end, offers the geological community by option for the Anthropocene as an epoch, the chance to take an epistemic leadership in a very important field, uh, give a very important message to society and throw their white behind one can. And I see a risk coming up that either they do this relatively soon, maybe in four years, maybe in eight years, but they do it relatively uh, soon, or they will simply lose epistemic leadership on how uh, our global societies in plural understand world and earth with capital or non-capital letters and the interplay with them. And I find this stupid and I don't understand why intelligent people do not see the chance and try to uh, size it. Just one uh, very interesting, most interesting commentary. I just make from the kind of history of social and scientific change. It is frequently the case, as some people have observed, that when there is such a profound challenge and, 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 uh, at an epistemic level, uh, one often has to wait, wait for the old generation to die out and the new generation to come along. Well, that may then happen in the next decade, yeah. seeing the age of some. 
All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me move on to uh, Victor's question from the uh, chat, and then we uh, will see if we have time left for Peter's question. Uh, with Peter, it's always very nice that you try and come up with a strategy to have people post their questions in the chat so that they're very short, and then he writes an essay more or less in the um, uh, chat. But that's fine. Thank you, Peter. I will try. Uh, we will try to get you your question as well. But let's first maybe go to Victor's question, who, um, which is the the, the latest one uh, in the chat, who is asking about this characterization of the Earth's otherness. Um, and what kind of thesis of non-totalization this uh, proposes. Uh, so he then goes into how Derrida makes a differentiation when it comes to non-totalization. Um, on the one hand, because the Earth is maybe something like an infinite ground that cannot be captured by finite uh, with finite means, uh, be they discursive or technological or whatever. Um, or on the other hand, totalization is impossible because the Earth uh, is a finite ground that excludes any attempt. Uh, of totalization because it lacks an internal ordering. Um, and yeah, he then writes how the one would lead to a cumulative and fragmented understanding of Earth, uh, and the second requires this continuous revision of our narratives. I think this is also closer maybe to what uh, Bronislav was saying, um, by means of a self-critical uh, exercise. So um, yeah, so how to characterize the Earth's otherness and what kind of type or can we distinguish uh, the kind of non-totalization that is at stake there? Yeah, look, thank you for that. I mean, I, I do struggle with this, as you might have guessed from my talk, that um, what are the epistemological means, if I can put it that in that kind of grand way, um, of accessing the Earth's otherness. I mean, because what we're doing is we're going against the whole uh, modern rationalist project. Uh, and one of the re reasons why I'm, in, you know, I'm, I'm attracted to this community of scholars is because there's an openness to that. Um, whereas for other communities of scholars, I'm thinking particularly of kind of mainstream philosophy has just kind of horrified at any mention of, of uh, you know, the otherness of the earth or um, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think in a way, I mean, look, let me let me just make this point, and it's not an intellectual kind of point, but, you know, it's out there, out there in the general community, the engaged environmental community. There is a, it's true to say, a very deep sense that, that the earth is something uh, beyond us, Beyond, uh, although of course reason, science, and technology uh, contribute enormously to our understanding, um, they will never do. And there is something inherently uh, other you know, mysterious about the Earth which always holds itself back. Now, this is a sense that we have, uh, many of us have, and I think it's very, very difficult to explain. Um, and it, may even be one of those things, I think it's the, the Zen statement, um, um, how does it go? Um, uh, yeah, that which can be spoken is not the real thing. Uh, in other words, as soon as you try to articulate it, you start to lose it. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, I think what uh, the advent of the Anthropocene does, for some of us at least, is demonstrate that the grand modern project of, uh, of knowing the earth in its totality uh, and of controlling it is, is beyond us. And kind of thank God that it, that it is, because imagine the kind of earth that we would have if uh, the more out there geoengineers uh, had their way and seized control of the earth and regulated it to a fine degree to suit human needs. Um, yeah, but it's a big question, obviously, and a hard one. Yeah, that it is. Uh, thank you for that. Victor, do you want to take a few minutes to um, maybe briefly respond to this or share some thoughts you had on the on the subject? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, thanks both, uh, Jochen also for um, posing the question and Clive for your answer. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not 
I'm not even completely sure what what would be the implications of the question uh, I put. So that's why I just formulated it as a means of clarification because I would have to think more. But okay, if 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 Earth is this something beyond us and has this uh, mystery or, or this something something mysterious in it, I, for me it makes a difference if if we think of it. So the, okay, uh, for me, the, there's the risk that this mystery can become sort of essential or romanticized and detached from the material realm, so to say. So that then, um, I really, I really, I find really stimulating all these uh, theological notions that 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 have, I believe, political potential to to just think the Anthropocene now. But at the same time, there's there's the risk that if we don't better clarify how this other how can we access as you said with this epistemological means this this otherness of of this earth there are two big branches right like one that okay this mystery can be just simply simply nothing or maybe i'm saying this like too fast i'm not sure but but if we fall into the in romanticizing this mystery that it might have maybe we are ascribing an essence to it in 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 trying to do so but 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 yeah i i yeah i'm, I'm, I'm not really sure no no no, no i uh, i get it uh, there's actually a very good discussion in agostino sarah's book which i fully agree with about about um how important it is to um carry on a philosophical argument at a level that doesn't get dragged into politics, if you know what I mean. Because if you say, well, okay, it's all very well to uh, make a hypothesis, even from a secular person like me, or a, what is secular really me, um, the otherness of the earth, but isn't there a kind of danger in that, that it can become romanticized and then used for ulterior and potentially dangerous purposes. And yeah, that may be so, um, but um, but that ought not to prevent us from thinking about it and talking about it and trying to understand uh, what it means. Uh, in other words, you know, you know, as I said in my critique of the um, Marxist, neo, mar, neo Marxist, eco Marxist uh, uh, representation of the Anthropocene as just another stage in the development of capitalism and colonialism, and the you know, very popular concept of the capitalocene. Um, that's all very well, and I'm not saying that uh, considering social justice is unimportant, quite the reverse. I've, spent, I've written books about it um, since from the late 1990s. Um, but that's not what we're talking about now. Uh, we're talking about we're philosophizing. You know, we're we're going to a different level to think about the problem that we are confronted with. And if we're constantly drawn back into, well, what are the political implications of this? Well, what does this mean about what we should do about climate change? We're lost. You know, we should let's stop philosophizing and start talking politics. So that's what I always try to keep in mind. Mind you, it's difficult. You know, when I gave talks about Defined Earth, after the book came out, as you do, you go around your public talks, as soon as it came to, um, you know, question time, it was, all, it was always, but what, what can we do? What gives you, and a horrible question, what gives you hope? I think, oh, let's just set those things aside and try to just sit and reflect. Just sit and philosophize about what this means. Now we're trained to do that, and it's a great privilege that we have the capacity uh, to reflect, to philosophize, to meditate, as if you like, on what it means, rather than to constantly come back to, well, you know, uh, is Lu is Lula going to look after the Amazon? Um, so uh, I just I just call for a um, a separation of powers, let's put it that way. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time, I'm uh, afraid. Um, I really enjoyed it, uh, both your talk and the discussion uh, here. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Clive, for uh, joining us uh, here today and giving your talk. There's a, a lot, I think, to uh, think about. Um, and I'm glad to report we will continue thinking about uh, this. Uh, in two months, we will uh, return. Um, where Bronislav uh, will give a lecture. Um, let me see what the exact date is. It's the 9th of May, um, but I will send around, of course, all the uh, links. I also want to thank Bronislav for your uh, response, which I think uh, sparked a, a good dis discussion. And there was a lot of uh, stuff there as well. Uh, made a lot of notes of things I have to read, which is always a good sign, I think. Um, Thank you all for joining us here today. I did make a recording, so hopefully that all works out and we'll upload it uh, later. I will um, send well, info about this as well. People yes. have made some really fascinating comments on the side here, which I'd love to have access to, to read and think about later. Absolutely. Well, uh, can, I, can I get access to them somehow? Yeah, I will uh, just put them in a Word document, like all the questions, and forward it uh, to you. I was just about to. If anyone would like to send me comments, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I have to do a lot of boring uh, meetings from now on. So like I said at the beginning, Clive, this was definitely the high point of the day. Um, thanks once again for joining us. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.